Good morrow, friends. I'm Jordan, and this is Not Strictly History. Hello, 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 everybody. It is so magical to be here with you today. Welcome to this week's episode of Not Strictly History, which is part two of Winnie the Pooh. And I'm very excited to be doing a part two to an episode. And I'm even more excited that that part two gets to be Winnie the Pooh. Because as you may or may not have noticed in last week's episode, I love Winnie the Pooh. And he definitely deserves all of the good things and to have all of the good things said about him. Before we begin, um, there's a little bit of housekeeping business that I need to attend to. And by this, I mean I have an announcement. This episode my friends, is the last episode ever. No, I'm kidding. That's That was a lie. Um, that was kind of rude. This episode is the last episode of Not Strictly History Season 1, which means that there's going to be a little bit of a break while I get things for Season 2 put into place. So it's going to be a while before you hear from me again, which is a little bit sad and... Um, Actually, it's a lot a bit sad, but again, I'll be getting things ready for season two. Season two will probably be longer than season one. We'll have, of course, new stories, fresh perspectives. We're going to have some guest appearances. It's going to be good. It's going to be really, really good. I'm excited for season two. So I'm excited for this little break where I can just get everything ready for it and create new, fun, wonderful content for all of you. Season one has been so much fun. It's been so much fun to talk about history and all things not strictly history with you guys, to talk about some areas of history that I'm really passionate about, some areas of history that I didn't know anything about and got to learn more about. It's been fun talking to you guys about things that I'm passionate about outside of history, like movies or musicians. The whole thing has been a really, really good experience for me. And I am so, so happy that I did it. So thank you to all of you for being here through season one, through Al Capone, the Hadrian's Wall, the Pueblo Revolt, uh, Pretty in Pink, Macklemore, like just all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I cannot wait to continue the journey with you next season so please stick around for season two feel free to dm me or at not strictly history underscore podcast on instagram or you can even email me at not strictly history at gmail.com if you would like to request episodes for next season if you have any suggestions anything like that let me know because i want season two to be just It's going to be fun, but I want it to be a season where I cater more to what you guys are looking for and things that you would like to hear about. So please reach out and let me know if you have any suggestions for content or anything like that. Um, And I will do my best to get that squared away for all of you. So there you have it. There's our little announcement. And let's get into today's episode, which is again... The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, Part 2. So if you will remember, last week we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about the beginning of Winnie the Pooh, how A.A. Milne bought Christopher Robin a teddy bear when he was one year old, and this bear was originally named Edward Bear, and then Edward Bear eventually became who we know as Winnie the Pooh. We talked about the books that started off the whole Winnie the Pooh story. We talked about the Christmas Eve story in the newspaper. We talked about the origin of Winnie the Pooh's name. We talked about a lot of different film adaptations. We covered a lot of ground last week. And if we, we ended the episode with me just gushing about how much I love Winnie the Pooh, which was beautiful. But you may have also been thinking, okay... Jordan, what more could there be? Like, what have we not talked about? And that's a really good question. Trust me, it's a brilliant question. But 
actually, there's quite a bit that we haven't talked about. So let's get into it. I'm just going to start off this episode by giving you a few more simple fun facts about Winnie the Pooh and all the things. So we've talked a lot about film adaptations. We talked about that quite a bit last week. Let's talk about some more books. Now, again, we only got a handful of works from the man himself, A.A. Milne. However, in the year 2009, an official sequel was authorized, and it was entitled Return to the Hundred Acre Wood, which is just enough to just pull at my heartstrings every which way. So this book was written by David Benedictus, who further developed the characters we know and love without changing them, of course. It was illustrated by Mark Burgess and drawn in the style of E.H. Shepard. So we didn't stray from the Winnie the Pooh that we know and love at all. And again, that was in 2009. In 2016, another sequel was authorized, and it was called Winnie the Pooh, The Best Bear in All the World, which is not an exaggeration, my friends. So this book was made up of four different short stories that were each written by a leading children's author of the time. So we had Kate Sanders, Brian Sibley, Paul Bright, and Jean Jean. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Jean, we'll say Jean Willis. And it was again illustrated by Mark Burgess in the style of E.H. Shepard. Now this little collection sequel is so beautiful. And it's just... I just have so many good things to say about it. But one of the, the really, really fun things about this book is that it actually introduced a new character. Now, I'm a purist, my friends, and when it comes to the stories that I know and love, I'm not very flexible when it comes to new characters. Like, if I'm reading a book series, for example, and the second book is not in the perspective of the whoever the first per, Let me start over. <laughs> if I'm reading a series and the perspective that the story is told from changes in subsequent books... I have a really, really hard time wrapping my brain around it. Even if I already know that character and love that character, I'm just not used to seeing the story from their perspective. And I have, I have to have this whole like loyalty struggle within myself, which is a thing. Okay, that's just a thing. But this book, again, introduces a new character. And I expected to be upset about this, but I'm not. And I'm going to tell you why. So this new character is called Penguin. And Penguin was inspired by a long-lost photo of A.A. Milne and Christopher Robin with a toy penguin. And that, my friends, is why I can't be upset about the introduction of Penguin. Because it is, it's inspired by an actual toy penguin. It's inspired by a, a person, a character, a thing that truly existed and meant something to Christopher Robin. And so I think it's beautiful that we brought Penguin back into this lovely little sequel. Now, let's move on. In 2018, we saw the publication of the short story, Winnie the Pooh Goes to London. I could go on and on and on about this story for like 17 years, but obviously Pooh Bear visits London, and while he's in London, he ends up meeting the Queen. So this book was written to commemorate the very significant birthdays of both Pooh Bear himself and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And I'm so pleased and so happy to be able to say that I actually got to purchase this book while I was living in London. And I'm pretty sure that I got it at the gift shop at Westminster Abbey, which makes me happy, happy, happy to this day. But at the time that I bought it, I remember seeing it on the shelf. And I remember saying out loud, Winnie the Pooh goes to London. And my heart like exploded everywhere and I couldn't deal. And I bought it immediately and it was the happiest day of my life. So this book, it not only reminds me of my time in London and how much I loved it there, how much I miss it, but it's also, it's about one of my favorite people in the world, Winnie the Pooh, who is very, very special to me. But it is also about Queen Elizabeth II. I love it so much that Winnie the Pooh gets to meet the Queen because I'm still having a hard time accepting all of that, um, that she's not here anymore and all of that um that's a story for another time but yeah we're not there in my world so 
we really love. <laughs> the uh, The moral of the story is it's a very good little book, and I suggest you buy it. Winnie the Pooh Goes to London, published in 2018. We also need to talk about the Victoria and Albert Museum, my friends. And I know you did not see this coming in a Winnie the Pooh episode, but it's actually very, very important. So if you've never heard of the v it's an incredibly amazing, wonderful museum in London that was started by Victoria and Albert in the 1800s. And it's, it's a huge deal, okay? The Victoria and Albert Museum, the v it's a big deal. But they always have the most incredible displays. I mean, it, you guys, it's such an, an amazing museum. I guess it's technically an art museum, but it just has everything under the sun that you could ever possibly want or need in your life. And I, I just love the V&A. If you ever go to the cafeteria there, get their raspberry muffins. You will thank me later. Thank you. So in December of 2017, a display went public at the v that was named Winnie the Pooh, Exploring a Classic. So the manuscripts of the first two works were on display, as well as various teddy bears that hadn't been on display in over 40 years due to their fragility. As part of this exhibit, the v put a whole line of products out in their gift shop that are Winnie the Pooh themed. And yes, I absolutely did spend a lot of money on all of those. Do I regret it? No, I regret nothing. There are copies of the original sketches that you can buy, Winnie the Pooh pins, books, like anything you could ever want Winnie the Pooh themed, the v has. And I bought so much of it and it's beautiful. I have postcards of the original sketches and they're hanging in my office actually, which makes me very, very happy when I'm at work. There are so many beautiful things and it's very close to my heart that the V&A did this and that these products are available for everyone. And it, it's so important to, you know, British history, yes, but I think to all of our history in general, especially because so many of us know and love Winnie the Pooh. And so I love it that these products are available and that they are still available. I mean, they didn't leave, you know, once the display ended. So if you go to the V&A today, you can buy... Winnie the Pooh things. And I highly suggest a visit to the V&A and a visit to their gift shop so that you can partake in all of the Winnie the Pooh goodness because it's incredible. And speaking of stores in London, we need to talk about Hamley's Toy Store, my friends. Not only is Hamley's Toy Store just the most incredible toy store in the world, my friends, this toy store is six floors. Six floors of toys. It's incredible. Okay? It's incredible. It's just amazing all on its own. But they also have Winnie the Pooh stuffed animals and several of his friends that you can purchase. And even better than this is the fact that all of the animals are modeled after the original sketches. So these stuffed animals are actually just absolutely gorgeous honestly and they are so precious like they are quality goods my friends and they are again they're so beautiful because they're modeled after the original sketches so I bought my younger sister um the Tigger stuffed animal because not only is Tigger just iconic in every way and wonderful but my little sister was Tigger for Halloween for basically her entire childhood so He's, you know, he's just a part of who she is at this point. But again, this these stuffed animals at Hamley's are just so beautiful. So again, I would encourage you to visit Hamley's and get some. Now, for all of those of you who is pretty much most of the people who listen to my podcast at this point, you can't do that. So I will add links to both the v and um, gift shop and to Hamley's so that you can at least see some of the products that they have because, again, they're just absolutely stunning. Don't you even worry, my friends. We're only about 15 minutes into this episode, but I still have a lot of fun facts for you, okay? There's still a lot more that we need to talk about with Winnie the Pooh. We absolutely cannot do a Winnie the Pooh episode without touching on all of the things that make Winnie the Pooh and his friends the most incredible characters 
in the entire world because that wouldn't even be a Winnie the Pooh episode. So this next fact that I'm going to tell you is something that is just, it is iconic beyond belief. It is incredible in every in every single way. And when I learned this fact while I was researching, it made me so happy that I had to just stop and take a break for a minute because that's how incredible it is. So without further ado, my friends, in 1958, Winnie the Pooh was translated into Latin. That's correct, my friends. Winnie the Pooh was translated into Latin by one Alexander Leonard. Again, this was in 1958. And by the year 1960, this book had become the only book in Latin to ever be on the New York Times bestseller list. Icon, 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 my friends. Not only does Winnie the Pooh exist in the Latin language, but it is the only Latin book to ever do so and end up on the bestseller list. Can I get applause? Thank you. How, like, I'm trying not to laugh in absolute glee because how amazing is that fact? If anybody can do it, it's Winnie the Pooh. I mean, come on, for like, for real. So it's just amazing. Um, in 2006, Winnie the Pooh received a star on the Walk of Fame for his 80th birthday, as he freaking should, by the way. Thank you. In 2010, a man by the name of James Campbell made an incredible discovery, my friends. This is a beautiful little twist. Well, twist is definitely not the right word, but it's a beautiful little moment in the story of Winnie the Pooh. So this man, James Campbell, was married, was, is, married to E.H. Shepard's great-granddaughter. So the granddaughter and husband took over the Shepherd estate in 2010, and subsequently they discovered a whole bunch of drawings and unpublished writings, including very early drawings of Winnie the Pooh that hadn't been seen in years and years. Can you even imagine how phenomenal that would be? Like, I, it's just so magical. You get to take over E.H. Shepherd's estate You're going through his things and you find early sketches of Winnie the Pooh and writings that have never been seen. And, you know, these sketches haven't been seen in decades. And, like, there's so much about this that is incredible. And there's so much about this moment that was probably so magical. I mean, because at this point, you're thinking, like, there's nothing more original. Like, we have Winnie the Pooh. It's, it's you know, we're here. But, but wait, no, there was more that was found. And I, I just love that so much. Also in 2010, the Royal Mail released special stamps based off of the original illustrations by E.H. Shepard. Now, we need to just take a moment and sing praises to the Royal Mail because but also to just postal services in general. I don't know what it is, okay? But when a postal service comes out with commemorative stamps for something, it does something to my heart. It does something to my soul that is just wrenching. And it makes me so, so incredibly happy. That's, I just, it's so good and pure and beautiful when a special stamp is released. And I will die on this hill. There's no reason for us to argue about that, but I feel very strongly about it. So there you go. Um, In 2011, a poll was conducted and Winnie the Pooh was voted onto a list of those that were considered the top 100 icons of England. Can I get an amen and a major yes? Thank you. So I'm not sure when this was, but Maeve Kennedy of The Guardian wrote that Winnie the Pooh is quote, the most famous bear in literary history, to which I say, absolutely, thank you, because he is, he is the most famous bear in literary history, he's the most iconic bear in literary history, he is the most beautiful, the most sensitive, the most wonderful, the most loving, the most caring, he is Winnie the freaking Pooh, and I love him, (laughs) 
So let's touch on just a few more absolutely incredible facts. A. A. Milne's original manuscript are housed at the Wren Library in Trinity College, Cambridge. This is, if you'll remember, A. A. Milne's alma mater. He went to school at Cambridge, and he bequeathed the manuscripts to them so that they could be displayed there, which I find very sweet. Very sweet. In 1982, Oxford University created the Winnie the Pooh Society. Like, kill me. That's the most incredible thing ever. How do I sign up? And... Okay, this is this, this, my friends, this is so incredible. Did you know that Winnie the Pooh has inspired several, and by several, I mean like an entire body, an entire field of work that, that, how do I explain this? There are many, many, many different philosophical works out there that use Winnie the Pooh as a basis. There is an entire field of philosophy based upon Winnie the Pooh and and the philosophies in Winnie the Pooh, how Winnie the Pooh has impacted society. Like there is a legit philosophical place for Winnie the Pooh and for academic research and knowledge and work about Winnie the Pooh. And the scholar in me is freaking out about this and I love it so much I highly recommend you look into this okay do not let today end without researching the philosophical works that were inspired by Winnie the Pooh because you will be delighted you will be surprised you will be elated you will be shocked you will be intrigued that I can promise you So I'm pretty excited about this next little section that we have going on here because we need to do something very important. We've talked so much about Winnie the Pooh and about his friends in general. We've talked about the majesty that is the 100 Acre Wood and all of these things. But we have not talked about each of his friends specifically. And we need to do that. We need to spend just a little bit of time talking about each of Winnie the Pooh's original friends. And that's kind of a misleading statement because I actually didn't include Kanga and Rue in here, which was rude of me. Let's talk about them really quick. Kanga and Rue are amazing. I love Kanga because she is the only woman, first of all. She's also an amazing mother And she tries to mother everybody. I love Rue because he adores Tigger. Rue wants the best for everyone. Rue is your typical little boy with so much potential. And he is awe-inspiring. That's what I'll say about Kanga and Rue at this time. Let's go. Let's continue forward. And let's talk about Piglet. Now... Piglet, it's well known that Piglet is Winnie the Pooh's very best friend after Christopher Robin. Piglet is a really interesting character. Piglet has a stutter. He's well known for always being afraid. But the thing about about Piglet is that even though he's afraid of pretty much everything, he really is so incredibly brave. I think I touched on this a little bit last time. Piglet is very, very brave, maybe the bravest out of all of the friends, because he is constantly rising above his fears in order to save his friends, in order to save the day, in order to find the solution to any problem. And that's another thing about Piglet that is just so beautiful. He is very, very solution-oriented. Anytime there is a problem, Piglet wants to fix it. You'll notice that Anytime something goes wrong, the first thing Piglet says is, oh dear, what do we do? He's always in, how do I help? How do I fix this mode? And coming from a tiny little Piglet who was always afraid, that is incredibly endearing. Another thing that I love about Piglet is just his unabashed love and loyalty and support for his friends. His friends are everything to him. They are his whole world. Everything he does is for his friends. 
And a lot of the time, Piglet is kind of in the background, even though he's kind of, like, you could kind of consider Piglet Winnie the Pooh's sidekick. Um, but again, he's in the background a lot. However, Piglet acts as a kind of glue, and he really keeps everybody together in a way that he definitely doesn't understand, but in a way that I think many of the friends don't understand either. I think they all get very comfortable with Piglet in his I'm scared position, and I think it's very rare that they step outside of that and understand just how brave he is and how much he's always willing to sacrifice for his friends. He is so inspiring, and I genuinely love him. I love Piglet so much. Next, we're going to talk about Tigger, the absolute icon that is Tigger. Where, like, where do you even start with Tigger? I mean, it's really intriguing because Tigger has more of a backstory, I think, than anybody. And also, he doesn't have any backstory at all. Because if you remember, in the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, this is kind of when we meet Tigger for the first time. And I've, you know, you pick that up from context clues. So Winnie the Pooh hears something outside and he's like, OMG, what's outside? And he hears this little like growling noise. And then Tigger jumps into his house, bounces on Pooh and introduces himself, which leads you to believe that this is the very first time Pooh has ever met Tigger. So my entire life, I have been sitting here wondering, well, where the heck has Tigger been this whole time? Why is he just now coming into the Hundred Acre Wood? Like, what's going on? Like, I have had questions since day one, and I don't have any answers. Has Have any of you ever thought about that? Any of you? Let me know, because I, again, I just, I have a lot of questions. So, remember, that's that's kind of the first Tigger we get in a film. Now, not only this, Tigger has his very own song, which I almost just burst out singing involuntarily. I will not be singing the song, but he has his own song and it's beautiful. Tigger is always happy. He's always happy. He loves his friends and he wants everybody to always be having fun and to always be happy. He's absolutely what you would call the class clown. He is just the epitome of a class clown. He's a silly joker. He's always just trying to lift everybody's mood And here's the thing, Tigger is hysterical, people. Like, I touched on this a teeny bit in the last episode. Tigger is so funny. Tigger is absolutely so funny. Like, I don't even... Tigger is so freaking funny, okay? He's so many of the funny things that exist in Winnie the Pooh exist because Tigger exists. I love him. He's inspiring. He's amazing. He's very caring and loving and loyal. And I mean, he's freaking Tigger. I mean, what, you know, he's freaking Tigger. And talking about Tigger kind of gives us a natural segue into the next character that we need to talk about, who is Rabbit. Now, the reason that this is sort of a natural segue is because Rabbit is pretty well known to not super like Tigger. Now, I don't. I don't want to want to say that definitively because all of the friends are incredibly loyal to each other and they all love each other very, very much. But I think it's safe to say that Rabbit is annoyed by Tigger. Tigger kind of challenges Rabbit in a lot of ways. But let's talk about Rabbit himself and then we can kind of discuss why that is. So Rabbit is an avid gardener. Um... He has very exacting standards. Now, he can easily be considered uptight, but I think he just has high standards, personally. He's not super playful in any way, but he is unflinchingly supportive of his friends. You know, he's often considered the smart one among them. Often when they have problems, they go to Rabbit because... And I think it's because, again, he has these exacting standards. He always has something that he's doing. He's always working on his garden, getting ready for something. He always has something on his plate and he's very organized. And I think that this gives his friends the impression that he's the smart one. He's the one that's going to figure everything out. And Rabbit knows this. He knows this about himself and he knows this about his friends. And so one of his best qualities is that no matter what important thing he's working on, no matter what's on his plate at the time, he will always abandon it in order to help his friends. 
He's very, very protective of them in that way. And it's actually just really, really sweet. He's kind of prickly in a lot of ways. But again, he's very protective of his friends and he will do anything for them because he wants them to be happy and he wants them to be safe. And I just love that about him. I love that about Rabbit. But again, I mean, it can, it definitely explains why Tigger challenges him, why there's a little bit of a hard time there because Rabbit is a teeny bit uptight. He has exacting standards and Tigger just wants to have fun like all the time. So it's pretty understandable why Rabbit would have a hard time with Tigger. But again, their relationship is actually really, really sweet. And I, I just love them so much. Next, my friends, we are going to talk about Owl. I love Owl. I've always loved Owl. I love Owl because he's sort of an enigma. Yeah, that's the right word. He's sort of this character that you don't really understand. To be honest, you don't super get why he's even there. Um, and I mean that in the best possible way. Let's Let's talk about him. So Owl... He's always talking about his family history. He's that person that's just has a million relatives who have done incredible things and he just spends all of his time talking about them. He, in a lot of ways, he's the most detached out of all of the friends because he's just caught up in the scholarliness of his life, I think. Now, it's really intriguing because he is this way, you would think that he would be considered the smart one. You would think that his friends would go to him anytime they needed a problem solved. And they do occasionally. However, it's usually pointed out that this was a bad idea and they should have gone to Rabbit. Um, case in point, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, The Grant... No, uh, well, that's not what it's called. Case in point, The Search for, for Christopher Robin movie. Owl is the one that they go to for help. He misreads the note, sends them on a wild goose chase. And at the very end, Rabbit says, that owl, I knew Skull had another Y in it. Like, that is that brilliant line that's so hysterical. But it's also a moment of Rabbit being like, oh my gosh, owl, like, really? Why did we even listen to him? So it's actually really, really funny in a lot of ways. Owl is... In a lot of ways, you have to sit there and wonder, like, what does he really contribute to the friend group? What is Owl's true purpose in the 100 Acre Wood? Now, I've I've thought about this quite a bit. Here's the thing. Owl is incredibly funny in his own very, very dry way. He has a very strong air of sophistication. And to be honest, he is the one in the friend group that you just need. He's this calming, boring, (laughs) very consistent, dependable presence that every friend group needs. And maybe he, maybe if you stop to think about it, you don't super know why he's there, but he's important. And it wouldn't be the friend group without him. And the thing about Owl is that he really does care about his friends. He's very much a homebody, but he cares for his friends. And when it really matters, he does show up for them. Finally, my friends, we have come to the one and only Eeyore. Eeyore, who is easily the most relatable character in the entire Winnie the Pooh franchise. Now, it has been theorized, I have seen this in many places, that the different characters in Winnie the Pooh represent different mental illnesses. I don't know if you guys have heard about this theory. I'm calling bullcrap. There's no effing way. Um, however, Eeyore is well known for being very, very gloomy. He's usually quite sad and depressed. Now, but here's the thing. He's actually hysterical. Eeyore's humor is very dark, very depressive, and again, out of this world relatable. Pretty much anything Eeyore says, you think, oh yeah, like I've been there, I understand. He is also... And because of that, because he's so relatable and understandable, he is out of this world funny. So in the movie, The Search for Christopher Robin, 
he says something like, no hope, no way to go, don't know what to do in the morning. Like, sounds like Wednesday night at my house. Like, who says that? Eeyore. But it's hysterical. I adore Eeyore. I love him with every fiber of my being. He's incredible. Again, he's incredibly relatable. He's incredibly realistic. The thing about Eeyore, if you stop to think about him for just a second, Eeyore is always the voice of reason. He is always the one who really understands what's what's real, what's true, and what's actually going on. You Maybe you'll remember that episode where Tigger takes a bath and all of his stripes get washed off and nobody thinks that he's Tigger anymore. And it's Eeyore who points out to him, it doesn't matter what you look like, you're always Tigger on the inside. And that's when his stripes come back. I mean, there are moments like that throughout all of the Winnie the Pooh stories. Eeyore is the voice of reason, the voice of reality, the voice of truth. And that's actually very beautiful when paired with the fact that he can be very gloomy and sad. He is, in my mind, and therefore, it must be true, (laughs) Eeyore is a foundation for his friends. He is this source of stability and security that they don't always realize that they need. They don't always realize that they have it in Eeyore, but he is that for them all the time without fail. He is stalwart, steadfast, loyal, and incredibly kind. You can always, always, always count on Eeyore for absolutely anything. You can always count on Eeyore to be there. You can count on Eeyore to know what's right and true and good. And you can count on Eeyore to support you and help you no matter what. And it's just incredibly beautiful and very, very sweet. So my friends, what an episode we've had. It's definitely a little bit on the shorter side, but I'm happy that we've been here together today. I'm happy that we got time to go over some fun facts, to talk about some new bu- newer books, and I'm so happy that we took the time to talk about Winnie the Pooh's friends because they're part of the whole story that we know and love so, so much. And, I mean, gosh, wh- where would we be without Winnie the Pooh and his friends? I actually don't want to know. If you know the que- If you know the answer to that question... I don't want to know. So let's come to today, my friends. Winnie the Pooh as a collection, as a collective, as a franchise, as a thing, has now entered the public domain in the United States. A.A. Milne's U.S. copyright on Winnie the Pooh expired at the end of 2021, as it had been 95 years since the publication of the first story. The copyright is still in place in the UK until January 1st of 2027, which will be 70 years since A.A. Milne passed away. Thank you, UK, for keeping things sacred. Love that about you guys. I think that here's the thing about this whole public domain business. I genuinely think that there are some positives to Winnie the Pooh being in the public domain. I do, but to be just incredibly, totally, you know, let's pause for a minute. I think I've said the word incredibly about 75,000 times in this episode. I apologize. And also it's a Winnie the Pooh episode. So I don't think you can really get mad at me for it. Okay, let's resume. I do think there are some positive things about Winnie the Pooh being in the public domain. But mostly, it just makes me nervous. I mean, Winnie the Pooh, again, for the millionth time, is so special to so many people. He is such a force for good. He and his friends mean so much and possess so much good for so many people. And I firmly believe that their stories should always be protected in some manner. Now, I I don't know exactly what that means, but I really do think that they should be protected in some way, shape, or form because they have this tradition of goodness and purity and connection to the public. I think that they kind of deserve that sort of protection. That's just me. You can let me know what you think. 
Um, one thing, though, that definitely gives me comfort is that Pooh Bear is still special to so many people. And even though, you know, public domain is a thing and some things have happened, um, there's a horror film that I'm not going to talk about. Um, anyway, so it does give me hope, though, because Winnie the Pooh is still a force for good. And he is so, again, he is so special to millions of people. And I don't think that that's something that goes away just because he's in the public domain now and people can kind of do what they want with Winnie the Pooh. I think that the main integrity of Winnie the Pooh and all of his friends is something that will stay intact because I just don't think it could be otherwise. I think that he's so important to us in our society and he has such a special place in our hearts that I think it will stay that way. I truly do. And it has been so much fun writing and researching for these episodes, getting to just gush about Winnie the Pooh. It's been so much fun talking about the history behind Winnie the Pooh, about the stories themselves, about his friends, about him. This has just been a blast, honestly. And it's also been a blast to do this podcast with you guys and to talk about all of these things that make me so happy these things that I'm passionate about. It has been such a wonderful opportunity to share all of it with you. And again, thank you so, so much for being here with me in season one. I can't wait for season two. Again, you can DM me at notstrictlyhistory underscore podcast on Instagram, or you can Gmail me at notstrictlyhistory at gmail.com if you have requests for next season, if you have comments, if you want to be part of the conversation, let me know. And I just, I'm feeling a little emotional. I am very grateful for you guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, for letting me teach you about history, for letting me gush about all these things. And again, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to do two parts about Winnie the Pooh, who is so special and so wonderful in every single way. And I will leave that with you. Ta-ta for now, and I will see you next season on Not Strictly History.